and welcome to part five of our lecture series on the urinary system. And in this mini lecture, we're going to take a look at collecting tubules and collecting ducts. Now, in comparison to the proximal tubules and the distal tubules that we've talked about previously, the collecting tubules and collecting ducts are going to be identified by the fact that they've got distinct cell, brown, cell boundaries, distinct, uh, almost like a block-like appearance to these cells. Uh, and so you look at them, uh, collecting tubules and collecting ducts are going to have distinct boundaries between the cells, these intercellular borders, and uh, they're going to have prominent nuclei uh, throughout the section. So it's basically going to look like within a plane of section, every cell is going to have a nucleus present. And so the cells are going to be uh, essentially classic, uh, simple cuboidal uh, in the smaller tubules to simple columnar. Uh, epithelia within the larger ducts, or a classic simple epithelia uh, that we've talked about and, and seen previously. Uh, if we take a look at the cytoplasm, uh, it's going to stain relatively poorly, so the cells are going to appear either clear or white, but basically a, a pale staining appearance uh, when you take a look at them. Now if we take a look at what's going to be occurring within the collecting tubules and the collecting ducts, is these are going to be the structures that are going to start out with those medullary rays that we talked about and then drain into larger and larger structures into the, the collecting ducts that are going to be passing through the medulla. And so they're going to be relatively straight structures uh, and they're going to be receiving the, the, the urine. They're going to be receiving that filtrate from the nephrons. And so they're not part of the nephron proper. The nephrons, again, as uh, we described them previously, are going to be uh, the glomerulus with the renal corpus von Bowman's capsule graining into the uriniferous tubule. The uriniferous tubule was the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending and ascending limb of the loop of Himley, and the distal convoluted tubule. What's going to happen, the glomerulus is going to have that raw filtration that's going to happen within the renal corpuscle. The uriniferous tubule is going to be modifying the materials that are passing through it and then ultimately it's going to dump this either hypotonic lower concentration or isotonic uh, kind of normal concentration of fluid in essence urine from the nephron into the collecting tubules of the cortex so it's going to dump it into the structures within these medullary rays and then it's going to drain from these collecting tubules into larger and larger collecting ducts and then ultimately into the collecting ducts that are going to pass through the medulla and dump our urine, dump our, our, our filtrate, our product into uh, our renal sinus where it's going to be collected and then uh, essentially funneled into the urine, ureter so that we're draining it from the kidneys itself. Now, if we take a look at the, the cells that are lining our collecting ducts uh, within the cortex and the outer medulla, we're going to see two types of cells, uh, which may be difficult to identify with normal uh, gametoxylin and gives stain sections. But we're going to have principal cells, and the principal cells are going to respond to ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and essentially change their uh, ability to essentially regulate the passage of water across the urinary lining. These are going to be relatively pale cells, some microvilli along the surface, some infoldings along the basal lamina, and they've also been described as having uh, a single cilia uh, along their apical surface. We get down into the inner medulla, essentially what we're going to be looking at is the collecting ducts are going to be lined almost exclusively by these principal cells. Now in between the principal cells in the cortex and the outer medulla are going to be some intercalated cells, and these intercalated cells are basically going to be there to control the acid-base balance within the body. And so the way they're going to do that is they're essentially going to be synthesizing bicarbonate in proportion to the acid that's being secreted in the body. And so if we're starting to secrete acid, secrete hydrogen ions, these cells are going to be producing more bicarbonate to try to balance uh, out the ions, the hydrogen ions that are being produced somewhere in the body that need to be filtered out. These are dark cells. Um, in electron microscopy. Uh, they have microvilli along the surface, uh, not as well as defined as what we saw in the proximal convoluted tubules, still some microvilli but no cilia uh, on their surfaces. So the important thing we're going to be looking at are basically these principal cells and we're going to be looking at their response to ADH. ADH, antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, is essentially manufactured by the supraoptic nucleus within the hypothalamus and it's produced 
in response to osmotic pressure uh, within the bloodstream. And what's going to happen is in the presence of ADH, in the presence of antidiuretic hormone, these principal cells of our collecting ducts are going to become permeable to water. And so what that means then is that water is going to be able to flow from the lumens, so essentially from that filtrate that's been passed through the nephrons, it's going to, water is going to flow into that hypertonic medullary interstitium. And so what's going to happen then is in the presence of ADH, fluid from the urine is going to flow from the collecting ducts into that medullary interstitium. Ultimately, it's going to be transported through the blood vessels in there. But what's going to be left behind is going to be a much smaller volume of urine. And that much smaller volume, again, because we reduced the volume, we took the water out of it, is going to leave those waste materials behind. So we're going to have a higher concentration or a hypertonic urine being produced. So again, if we take a look at this and put everything that we've talked about before, we've got our loop of Henle here with the descending limb, the ascending limb, countercurrent multiplication system because we've got one region that's wanting to run direction, the other region the materials are flowing in the opposite direction. So this loop of Henle is going to make, establish and maintain an osmotic gradient. So again, relatively normal concentration at the boundary between the cortex and the medulla. But the deeper into the medulla you go, the higher concentration that is established. So the loop of Henle, we've got this countercurrent mechanism. We go down, turn around, and come back up. But then when we take a look at our collecting uh, tubules and collecting ducts over here on the right-hand side, they're only going through in one direction. And they're going through in one direction. And in the presence of ADH, we allow essentially water to flow across these membranes Water is going to flow from the yellow space, the urine space, into the purple and essentially leave the solutes behind, but basically produce a much smaller volume of higher concentrated urine. So we're essentially concentrating the urine by recycling or maintaining water within the body. Now, in collecting ducts without exposure to ADH, uh, again, think about the term antidiuretic hormone. Okay. Antidiuretic hormone is essentially allowing us to preserve water within the body. In the absence of ADH, it's going to be the same as looking at what happens with a diuretic. A diuretic is going to be a substance that increases urine volume. And so something like alcohol or something that like caffeine inhibit ADH secretion. So what happens then is that if you inhibit ADH, you essentially remove ADH from this system, these principal cells within the collecting tubules and collecting ducts are going to remain impermeable to water. And so it's like we got a solid boundary so that that material that's flowing out of the distal tubules, that's flowing out of the nephrons, is going to go into these collecting tubules and collecting ducts. It's going to pass through the medulla without being modified. So it's going to pass through the medulla, pass down through these ducts without being altered. And so what we're going to do is produce a much larger volume of either hypotonic, kind of lower concentration, or isotonic urine being produced. So in the absence of ADH, a large amount of urine being produced with a relatively low concentration. And so this is like the, the materials that are coming directly out of the nephrons. They're not being modified as they're being passed through the collecting tubules and collecting ducts as they're going through the medulla. Now again, with this countercurrent uh, multiplication system, we're going to be establishing this huge osmotic gradient within the medulla. And so we're going to have this passive exchange between blood vessels within the basal recta, the blood vessels within the kidneys, and the interstitium. Uh, keep in mind that these blood vessels are going to be running roughly parallel to the descending and ascending limbs of the loop of Henle. So the blood vessels, again, are going to flow down into the medulla. We're going to pick up uh, kind of a higher concentration materials, but as they turn around and flow back up towards the cortex, those materials are going to balance out so that they become more concentrated going into the medulla, but come back to normal as they're flowing out of the medulla going back into the cortex. So it doesn't disrupt the osmotic gradient within the, the kidney, and it doesn't allow more concentrated waste materials to get into and circulate through the body. That finishes up our discussion of this countercurrent mechanism. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.
In the next mini lecture, we're going to look at what happens to urine when it leaves the kidney.